If we do continue on, you will see chapter 2, still different different species of dragons. As I said, a weaver, who which lives in Africa, which eats elephants, hippos, rhinos, large herbivores, you know? And if even a human can see that, for a huge dragon like this one, uh, they might look at the uh, elephants, rhinos might look like yummy, yummy plump cows or pigs. And yeah, and if you can see this huge bird like dragon, um, the author uses his imagination and actually says that this dragon is actually a kind of medieval phoenix. And this dragon probably aroused the myth of the Maya god about the Quetzalcoatl. And this the, this Mexican amphitheater almost certainly inspired the ancient Aztecs and their descriptions of their god Quetzalcoatl. Or I think I pronounced that right. I'm sorry, guys. I mean, it's it's really hard to pronounce. Beautiful. What's a bit of history in it, you know? And if you see, we are at Australia this time. This is called a marsupial, and this is a kind of dragon that cannot fly. And since Australia has been cut off to any other continent, it is one of the it has one of the most rarest and strangest creatures on this earth, unique only to Australia. And that counts for the dragons too. This dragon has a pouch resembling a kangaroo to put in their young. And since it cannot fly, that's also very unique. I mean, every dragon that I've heard of can fly, whether they have wings or not. Asian dragons don't have wings, but they can fly and control the weather. The re Chapter 3 is about the natural history of dragons, dragon biology and physiology. It talks about, it gives us the basic bone structure, muscle structure, and the outer appearance. And it too shows how the dragons make, make these awesome flames when they fight. And it also shows the difference between the eastern and western dragon. And it also talks about digestion. And it also talks about the fact that old dragons whose teeth cannot eat anything else except soft flesh it's the, you know, the princesses and the maidens that we see around. Chapter 3, Still Natural History of Dragons, the life cycle of dragons with the nice little eggs, how the egg matures. And finally, when they get this horn on their little, on their nose, they will manage to hatch. That's a real, and it show, also shows a lot of lifespans so that we can know how long they live. Mostly, the Chinese dragon lives the young, longest, 400 years. European dragons, 300. Amphitheater, 250. A knocker, which is kind of, kind of the most, you know, um, common. Lives for 120 years, while a human lives around the 70 to 100 years. Natural history and dragon behavior. Dragons wants to hoard. They want to hoard. And personally, this is, well, this, they have evolved to enable their survival as a species, which means that when the dragon's only weakness is their belly, which is soft, and the spear can easily pass through that, they have no scales on their belly. But if they Hoard stuff as it is seen. The jewels will cover the belly and make a kind of like a armor, perhaps. And it also talks about the courting behavior in which a male dragon gets a fine jewel to offer to the female dragon. Finally, it talks about working with dragons, which means how to tame them or how to make friends with them and personally western dragons are kind of hard to approach and they, they might you know eat you and stuff like that and then eastern lung uh a young 
in Korea as we call them, they are quite peaceful in general, and they are easily, easily uh, approached with delicious, the finest of all foods. Working with dragons, taming and flying dragons, it talks about the details in which sometimes a dragonologist, you will never ever ride a dragon, but only in the most desperate circumstances. And then it talk. There's an appendix where you can talk about a lot of things that not like dragon appendix really, and it's really just interesting. And appendix to. The usual spells and charms using the sample of dragon dust. This, the details of this stuff is shown in the actual book, which is a really interesting book to read. And then it talks about the talesman of Master Merlin, in which the actual book, in like the novel, this is the source of all the trouble and the bad guys want to have this so they can control the dragon. Appendix 3, Dragonologists and Dragon Slayers of History. And Dragonologist number 1 is Mr. Merlin. And he talks about a lot of, you know, knights who fought dragons. And really, really the, the like, Beowulf, also the famous Danish king. Uh, he also was a dragon slayer, apparently. And George, obviously this is the most famous of all dragon slaying things. But here it explains that the dragon George Cappadocius slew was not evil and was just hungry. And so what, what that means is that the people of Libya had become rich and their large flocks grazed on land that was once the habitat of the dragon's natural prey. So basically, there's, there's, no, there's nothing to eat. So he had to eat humans. Kind of a sad story, actually. And it also talks about Fu His Hisi, who is a dragonologist from China, and talks it talks about the fact that this dragonologist was actually the first recorded dragonologist ever, since you know the, these dragons are more friendly in general. I'm not surprised. And that's pretty much it. Was an afterward with a cool picture of a dragon. And I have fun reading. And personally, I myself want to be an author. And this really, even if it is a short picture book for children, it really guides my mind through the thing, through the kind of dragons and various mythology mythologies around the world. And I really enjoyed this book. I actually do recommend it to any age because even though I'm middle school, I enjoyed this, this book. And you will enjoy this book even if you're a first grader. And it was an epic book. It's a really helpful book if you're trying to write a fantasy novel about dragons. Great book. And like always, your book quester and the book quester. Fun book.